Coming up on Studios America, John Ziegler is here with the latest on the California recall election. The world is a little darker today after the loss of one of the greatest comedians of our era. And woke politics collided with ridiculous fashion this weekend at the annual Met Gala in New York. Let's take a few minutes to make fun of all these idiots as we do the hypocrites ball. This past Thursday, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers played a home game, uh, and the stadium was packed. I don't know if you saw the game. Packed. Wall-to-wall -wall people. It felt normal again. And I think sometimes we lose, we lose connection to how far things have moved. I mean, I know this is really frustrating, but I was at the previous game at that stadium, which was the Super Bowl. There was 11,000 people there. 11,000. That was in this year. It was in February of this year. Now, stadiums are packed all around the country. And things, some of the normal parts of life are starting to come back. For example, Madonna was half naked in front of an audience again, which was great. It was great to see her at 117, I'm, I'm guessing, years old, just kind of flapping on out of that tight leather thing, uh, just a big pile of Madonna in the middle of the stage. And it was, it was great, to, great to see that happening again. That was bravery, we were told. What a brave choice by Madonna to waltz her parts out there like that. That's not bravery in Hollywood, guys. Um, I'll give you bravery in Hollywood. Remember Joy Villa <laughs> walking out in the, the Trump 2020 dress? That, that was some, that was some bravery. Now, the bravery does not necessarily go to every single celebrity. These things uh, don't pass along. I mean, the, the brave choices people make are not brave. AOC was at the Met Gala and made some news with her stupid dress that says tax the rich. Now, if you think that's brave in New York City to come out and say tax the rich at the Met Gala, you're nuts. It's the most popular opinion in the room. Now, yeah, there's a bunch of rich people there who I guess would rather keep their money to spend on their yachts and donate to AOC's annoying charities. But in generally speaking, these people are the people who are for those viewpoints. There's no Trump 2024 dresses showing up at the Met Gala. She also had a purse that said tax the rich. And you'll note AOC's uh, garb here. Uh, really, only rich people could ever wear such a thing. A very expensive designer dress, designer purse, and a $35,000 a head ticket. Not exactly blue-collar, middle-class living, is it, AOC? Of course, AOC wants you to think of her as blue-collar and middle-class. Watch. When Aurora and I were first kind of partnered, uh, we really started having a conversation about what it means to be working class women of color at the Met. And we said, you know, we can't just play along, but we need to break the fourth wall and challenge some of the right. institutions. And, and <laughs> you know, while the Met is known for its, its spectacle, we should have a conversation about it. We should have a conversation about it, like a conversation about how the $35,000 tickets may have been better well distributed to, I don't know, homeless people outside, <laughs> for example. I do like the, uh, the irony of the tax the rich slogan printed on her multi-thousand multi dollar purse. Because that makes a lot of sense. Um, however, this is, it wasn't just AOC. This whole thing's an annoying spectacle and there's something really important to understand about it. For example, you have tax the rich. There was, um, uh, what's her face, Grimes here with her sword. Now, I don't know if you know who this is. I don't know who that is. But I can tell you who she's married to, Elon Musk. <laughs> now, I don't know if Elon Musk would qualify as being rich enough to tax. Uh, but uh, it seems like perhaps, possibly. And I will say, uh, Elon's wife gets to walk around with a giant sword. I walk into a Denny's one time with it, and they call the police. It's ridiculous. I, you, you know, we're also at that point where, like, if you make a finger gun in school, you get, like, arrested. 
How can you bring a sword into a museum in New York City? I don't know the answer to that. I guess, I, you know, very, a lot of money brings a lot of privilege, as we're seeing with these photos. Little Nas X was there going full C-3PO. You never go full C-3PO in your outfit. That's never a good idea, uh, but Little Nas X went for it anyway. Michael Bloomberg was there. Michael Bloomberg um, looking just dapper in the same suit he wore to the Met Gala in 1948. Uh, so congratulations there. Uh, after blowing all of his cash on the presidential run, though, I'm surprised he still has the cash to get into this little party. And 35000 is a lot to, uh, to Bloomberg at this point. Uh, Carolyn Maloney was there. Um, I think she was the mom on, uh, on Brady Bunch. I'm not sure who she is, but I think, uh, oh, she's a, congress she's a congressperson from New York's 12th district. Okay. Uh, it says equal rights for women. Um, now, I didn't get to go to the $35,000 ticket party. Do I get the equal access to that event? Equal rights. I'm not a woman, I suppose. And are women really women? What if they identify differently? Have you thought about that today, boys and girls? I mean, and all the other genders? I don't want to just say boys and girls. I don't want to limit it. There's also uh, Cara Delevingne. Now, I could lie to you and tell you that I knew who Cara Delevingne was, but I'm not that type of person. She's wearing a bulletproof vest with something that says Peg the Patriarchy, which is very, very clever. You see, that's kind of like, you know, you're fighting back against the man there, you know. You don't want these class systems where uh, people who have no merit just get handed their, li their life and their job and their status because of birth. That's ridiculous. But again, I don't even know who Cara Delevingne is. Um, I did look up a little bit on her. Uh, here's just some of her background. Delevingne's godfather is Condé Nast executive Nicholas Coleridge. Hmm. Her godmother is actress Joan Collins. Her maternal grandfather uh, was publishing executive and English heritage chairman Sir Jocelyn Stevens, the nephew of magazine publisher Sir Edward George Warris Holton and the grandson of newspaper proprietor Sir Edward Holton. Her paternal grandmother was the socialite, the Honorable Angela Marco Hammer Greenwood. Her paternal great-grandfather was the Canadian-born British, British politician Hamar Greenwood, first Viscount of Greenwood. And her maternal grandmother, Janie Sheffield, was lady-in-waiting to Princess Margaret. Ah, damn that patriarchy! Can you believe it? Oh, they really screwed her on that one. Um, you know, I will say, if I was in Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, which apparently was her big starring role, I'd probably wear a bulletproof vest, too. Just because if you're going to ruin the entire sci-fi genre for you know, generations to come... Some people get pissed off about that sort of stuff. Um, a giant grape also went to uh, the Met Gala. There she is. Um, is that, that is, I'm sorry, that is grape, the grape Kool-Aid man uh, showed up. Uh, <laughs> that is actually what ate Gilbert Grape. Just a, uh, just a trivia fact for you, if you like movies. Actually, I don't, I mean, we got it, Whoopi. You were in a color purple like a thousand years ago. Is this... Have you not? It's always the same thing. I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm a little, a little perturbed by that. Uh, but uh, actually, <laughs> Whoopi just showed up. Uh, she was actually at a fan event. She was playing Grimace next door and just waddled in. So that's how that picture got taken. But she looked beautiful. Um, also looking beautiful is the, the second dumbest uh, purple um, <laughs> at the event. Megan Rapinoe was there with her purple hair. And uh, she... She wore a, uh, she had a little purse there. She showed up, uh, showed to the cameras. It said, in gay, we trust, which is nice because it usually is in God we trust. So just, you know, just, uh, she's, she's trusting the, she's trusting gay. And it's almost, you know, when they say I identify as gay, some people really do. They're not just gay. They identify as gay. Everything about them all the time must be that we talk about what they do in their bedroom and what gender they do it with. I look, I mean, maybe maybe I've got the stuff to learn, but I feel like there might be other aspects of life that you could occasionally emphasize, but uh, apparently not. Now, I want to I, I don't want to show you this next picture quite yet because she just doesn't want the attention. Naomi Osaka, as you know, 
is a tennis player, tennis champion, who had to leave her press conference because she just doesn't want to be in front of cameras, doesn't want that sort of attention. That's not what she wants. She did show up at the Met Gala with this hair, though. And uh, it makes me... It makes me think that maybe she does want some attention. Now, interestingly, if she turns her head left and right, she can actually play tennis with that hair. That's a... People don't uh, realize that. Her hair, very flat and very wide for those on podcast. She also had a pretzel on her head. Uh, a pretzel with, <laughs> with some jewels or something in it. Um, and this is actually basically what I look like when I wake up in the morning, in case you were ever wondering about that sort of question. Uh, her mental health can't uh, handle getting asked questions about tennis but she can show up at the Met Gala looking pretty much like Angelica's doll on Rugrats, which is <laughs> almost an identical hairdo. Uh, Elliot Page made a, made a trip out. Excited to see Elliot Page out there, formerly Ellen Page. And I will say, and this is going to be, I know I'm on a conservative network. I know you're not supposed to say these things on a conservative network, but can we show Elliot again? I have to say this, Elliot looks better as a dude. I, I think this, you know, really does. The suit, not exactly fitting very well, but, he, you know, Elliot looks like a kind of a little boy who got dad's suit. And first of all, it's adorable. And second of all, I will say, I think this does fit Elliot Page. I am fully converted to the Elliot Page train now. I think that's the way it should have been the entire time. Congratulations to Elliot. Um, but you could at least, I mean, you've made a lot of money. You could at least afford some custom tailoring on the sleeves. That's all I'm going to say on that one. Um, and the bell of the ball was there. That's right. The bell of the ball. If you're going to have something to squash the patriarchy, uh, fight the man, uh, stop, the, stop the power, fight the man, all those things, you need an appearance from the man himself, Bill de Blasio. Bill de Blasio, who now... Congratulations to Bill. He's the second least popular person in all of New York because of Andrew Cuomo. So congratulations on that one. I think he wore the same suit to the party with the Sandinistas. A little inauguration thing from back in the day, which is really, really nice. And I don't know if he's trying out, but he should for Dumb and Dumber Part 5 because he would fit right in. <laughs> he, looks, he looks like he could be in that scene. <laughs> that doesn't even look like a Photoshop. Uh, some visual jokes here today for those podcast people. I'm sure they appreciate that. Uh, I will say this. Bill de Blasio might be the most perfect person to be at this event. All these people fighting the patriarchy. All these people fighting against uh, all, the, all the money in politics and all the m too much capitalism out there. And Bill de Blasio, de Blasio with his Sandinistas and his, his, his borderline socialist viewpoints strolls into the ritziest party in the world with his $35,000 tickets and probably an expensive suit, though it didn't look like an expensive suit. And he gets to stand there with all these rich people and party, party, party all the time. Notice these pictures I showed today, all maskless. Now, that's a fascinating thing because the kids of New York, they can't be maskless. They've got to go to school every day and wear a mask the entire time. There's Bill de Blasio, though, out at a big event with tons of different people from all over the place, and they're maskless. How did all these celebrities get to be maskless? Carol Markowitz pointed this out, and, you know, I, I don't doubt Carol Malko Markowitz. She's fantastic. I would never doubt her. But when she said this, I said to myself, did he really do that? Did he really? What she said was uh, that Bill de Blasio specifically exempted people like all the celebrities I just showed you from the mask mandate. And I looked up the executive order and gosh darn it, wasn't she right? This is the actual executive order from Bill de Blasio uh, for COVID. It says, I hereby order that the following individuals are exempted from this order and therefore may enter covered premises without displaying proof of vaccination, provided that such individuals wear a face mask at all times and are unable to uh, uh, and are, are they are unable to maintain six feet of distance from other individuals inside covered premises. Here are the groups. A non-resident performing artist. 
not regularly employed by the covered entity while they are in covered purposes for the purposes of performing. Well, I guess you get the party. A non-resident professional athlete sports team who, covers, uh, who enters a covered premises. A non-resident individual accompanying a performance artist or professional athlete sports team into a covered premises as long as, uh, as, uh, as part of their regular employment, so long as the performing artist or professional athlete uh, is competing in the covered premises. This is the larger point of all of this. They exempted athletes and celebrities from these restrictions. You have to have them. Your kids have to have them. All your friends have to have them. Only athletes and celebrities and big wigs and rich people, they don't have to have them. And the underlings that they employ, they don't have to deal with these things. You do. That's because these people are treated differently than you. They know that, you know, this is, goes back to what's going on today in California. Gavin Newsom went out to the French Laundry after telling everyone to stay home. Why? Because he knew he was different. He's different than you. He's better than you. He knows it. And you know what? If he wins tonight and he winds up holding on to this thing by the skin of his teeth, he's going to know it even more. He's going to be even more well aware that he makes rules for him that he does not need to follow. You need to follow him. Gavin doesn't need to follow him. So tonight, if you happen to be in California, we're going to be talking about this uh, election, of course, tonight as we go forward. Cast your vote. Definitely vote to get Gavin Newsom out of there. Anyone else for governor? Anyone else for governor at this point? In so many states across the union, anyone else for governor? Vote to get Gavin Newsom out, not just because Gavin Newsom sucks and he's a terrible politician and he's done a really bad job, but also to teach people that like this a lesson. You look at the Met Gala and you see people who need to be taught a lesson that they're not better than everybody else. It's not a lesson they're ever going to learn on their own. I promise you. So let's say you're going to the Met Gala and you've got the fancy dress on and you're looking all prim and proper and you realize, I don't even know what I'm going to drink for wine tonight. I haven't been exploring the world of wine at all. What will people think of me? Well, instead of uh, all that, you know, highfalutin nonsense, you could get Try First Leaf. First Leaf is a great, great service. They're a wine club. They curate and ship boxes of wine that are perfect for you. You can try wine from renowned winemakers all over the world. They can basically you fill out a little, you know, kind of a questionnaire as to what you like. Um, and they're going to give you all sorts of stuff you've never tried before. Uh, people love trying new wines, trying to explore new areas of wine they've never tried before. First Leaf uh, can save you time. It can save you money. Uh, we're talking about award-winning wines delivered to your door at 60% off retail. Explore a little bit. Treat yourself a little bit. You can adjust or pause your subscription at any time. They make it very easy. If you join today, you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 plus free shipping. Uh, my wife, Lisa, uh, got this. She, uh, she loves sweet wines. That's what she likes. So she put this in, and I, I don't even know. They, they just get, you, everything she gets is sweet. And, and her friends who explore a little bit more uh, make fun of her a little bit. But she discovered a couple of different wines through First Leaf that she really likes. And she was able to expand her horizons and not just drink. I think half of the time she wants to go to the store and just buy co alcoholic Kool-Aid. Okay? That's not what First Leaf is going to give you. They're going to give you high quality line, uh, wine. And uh, you're going to love it. Tryfirstleaf.com slash stew is the place to go. Six bottles of wine for $29.95 and free shipping. Tryfirstleaf.com slash stew. Well, he's everyone's favorite beacon of positivity. John Ziegler, senior columnist at Mediaite and author of the new piece, How Gavin Newsom and the News Media Defeated His Recall and What It Means for America. We'll send out a uh, tweet linking to it uh, for sure. John, how's it going? <laughs> well, Stu, as you know, um, the only time I ever get in trouble is when I'm a little bit optimistic. Uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm my normal pessimistic self, I'm almost always right. And unfortunately, I think I'm going to be about the California recall. Yeah, because we've had you on a couple times about the recall. And you started off a little skeptical that Gavin Newsom could be recalled, had a little bit of a transformation. And you're coming back to the negative side of this point, I think. Well, that's what the uh, the data and the events have dictated. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a data and evidence guy. And 
Um, you know, my hesitation when the polls tightened about a, a month or so ago was that there was a scenario where if the news media actually suddenly got a pang of conscience and decided to treat this process uh, fairly, that he could, underline could, I never predicted that he would, that Gavin Newsom could lose the recall. But as I talked about the last time you and I spoke, this was a very clear path that the news media was likely to take, which was to search and destroy Larry Elder, the pro-Trump conservative radio talk show host who you've had on uh, The Blaze, I'm sure, many times. And it was a very easy job for them to scare uh, what you might call independent-minded voters who were open to recalling Governor Newsom. And by my calculations, approximately 10 percent of the electorate went from yeah, I, I think I'm willing to recall Governor Newsom to, uh-oh, no way, not if this is the alternative. And so when it was a referendum on Gavin Newsom, this was a very, very tight and winnable race. But as soon as it became Gavin Newsom versus Larry Elder, it was over. I want to get into that uh, and that dynamic because it's an important one and it's something that Republicans can learn uh, from going forward here a little bit. Um, tonight, we do have obviously the elections going on right now. If you're going to go out and vote, please make sure you do that. It's, uh, it's still important and it's in the, the polls aren't so out of whack. I think it's being presented as impossible, though the polls have turned uh, against uh, the recall over the past week or two. Um, what we expect, I think, tonight, John, and I don't know how much you've heard about this, but they're counting, I believe, a set of Democratic positive votes first, then the day of votes, which were expected to be Republican. And then over time, and in California, it's weeks and weeks and weeks, we expect lots of Democratic votes to to pour in uh, past the deadline up to, I think, a week. Is that is that the right way to think about this? Yeah, I think that's probably right. But I, I think that by tonight, we'll know that, that this thing is over. Um, I don't know that it's going to go exactly the same way as we saw with the presidential election last year, where obviously the opposite occurred, where there were Republican day of votes. And then overnight, uh, there were the, the Democratic votes that had been mailed in that come in. But um, look, I agree. People, please vote, because this is a situation where the margin is going to matter. Uh, in, in a great way, because mm. if, if this is a blowout, uh, then Gavin Newsom is going to declare a mandate. And he is a megalomaniac who is going to be vindictive as hell. And he is going to punish, uh, I believe, uh, this state. I believe he'll punish us with more mask mandates, vaccine mandates. I believe he'll start on his climate change crusade, probably even make that some sort of a new emergency. This is a man who never gave up his emergency powers. And, uh, and and is really a, a one man dictatorship. And so, yeah, please do vote because uh, I, I still think there's a chance this thing stays within 10 points. I, I, I think that the best we could do is, is nine to 12 point loss at this point based upon the data. I think that's realistic. So I do hope that people do vote. Yeah, you know, I've been, I watched a few uh, baseball games from California, and you guys have been obliterated with ads. I mean, every single commercial break. It's three and four commercials. It's really amazing. Um, but one of the things that's been interesting about the approach of, of Newsom is at first he completely ignored this effort as it was building, and he acted as if it wasn't going on. Then it started, and for a while he really did flail around trying to find a message because there's not much he can point to that he's done positively for the state. It wasn't until Larry Elder really emerged as the leader of the Republican uh, opposition that he was able to focus and make this a two person race. And basically, you know, I like Larry Elder, uh, you know, but they just tried to scare people to thinking that Larry Elder was the Antichrist, basically. And it's very easy to do when you're a longtime conservative radio talk show host. You can take things out of context. It's very easily done. Uh, and uh, and frankly, the easiest way that they did it, and this goes to your point about a lesson for Republican voters, that e what they did was they simply showed a picture of Larry Elder arm in arm, thumbs up with Donald Trump. By the way, uh, that photo was in Barack Obama's ad against the recall. And I am convinced, and you know, I am not a conspiracy person. Uh, I, I despise conspiracies, but I, I got to tell you, that photo was literally whitewashed to make Larry Elder look as white as possible. He mm. is not a white looking person, as you know. Mm. Uh, his skin was lightened dramatically. His afro was hidden. Uh, I think they went out of their way to make it seem as if uh, Larry Elder was not a black man. And uh, and, and his treatment on racial uh, issues by the media was absolutely disgusting in this campaign. 
campaign. The LA Times did a, a piece called Larry Elder, the black face of white supremacy. Can you imagine Stu, uh, in the in the reverse, if uh, Larry Elder was a Democrat, they went on a search and destroy mission for Larry Elder, and unfortunately, the nature of his career and the nature of his support for Donald Trump made that very very easy in this state, and that's what saved Gavin Newsom. Along with, I want to make sure people understand the media coverage of this thing has been a joke. Uh, yeah. it, there has been no coverage at all of the failures of Gavin Newsom in any serious way. It, I believe if just one thing had been focused on by the news media, which was the closing of our schools needlessly and the damage that, that has done to our children for at least a generation and now the masking of our kids in classrooms, if, that, if, if moms had been fully educated about the scientific absurdity uh, and the political uh, nature of those decisions, I believe that alone would have made Gavin Newsom very vulnerable to losing this. But the news media never picked up that narrative. And instead, the narrative was Gavin Newsom wants to protect our kids, <laughs> which is, just shows uh, how uh, upside down the whole damn world is these days. Uh, you, you write in your piece, uh, the ramifications of Newsom not being recalled will be profound. And I've noticed this in the messaging, John, over the past week or two as Gavin Newsom's polls increased. It went from this idea that I think a lot of people were looking at Newsom, obviously for his hypocrisy, but also the poor way he handled the COVID situation. And that was really what a lot of people, I think, on, on the right, for sure, and even moderates who have kids in schools were voting against. Now the spin seems to be from the media that if he wins, it is a referendum on how well he did and how much people want these restrictions going forward. That's a scary prospect for California. Bingo, uh, Stu. And I think it's scary for the rest of the country. Let's be clear. If Newsom had lost, the pandemic was over. Uh, from, from President Biden to every blue state governor in the country, mm. that would have been the end of this. They all would have wet themselves and they would have realized that, OK, uh, we went too far. Uh, we got to reel this back in. Uh, let's pretend it's 2019 again, especially with football stadiums across the country being packed. That's not going to happen now. And instead, we may get the reverse. And let's be clear, the news media has a massive conflict of interest here. It's not just normal liberal bias. This is the news media carried Newsom's water on the lockdowns, on the mask wearing, on the school closures. They are as uh, vulnerable on this as he is. They're effectively on the same team. So if he gets exonerated by a so-called referendum on his COVID handling, they get exonerated too because they don't want it to be perceived that they blew it. They went along with a lie. And I cannot emphasize this enough because it never gets mentioned. When Gavin Newsom locked down California and changed the world, certainly changed America forever, he did so by claiming that 25 million Californians were going to get COVID in eight weeks. 25 million in eight weeks. Nothing even remotely close to that has happened over 19 months later. It was a lie. And he, he declared a false emergency. And everything flows from that. Now, there, there'll, there'll be some people who will absurdly claim, well, it was because of the mitigation. No, it's in, in the entire world, nothing close to that happened. It was a lie. And it was known to be a lie. I wrote about it being a lie the next day. And I was right. But no one cares because the media latched on to that narrative and they, and they are too invested to ever reverse it. And they will see his victory tonight as a victory for them as well. Mm. And what you're saying here, too, John, I think really helps explain the media strategy on the issues that have popped up late in the campaign with Larry Elder. For example, him getting, you know, an egg thrown at him by a woman in a gorilla mask, just completely ignored by the media. Uh, you know, Rose McGowan's accusation that the, that his, you know, Gavin Newsom's wife was trying to uh, talk her out of making these, uh, these accusations against Harvey Weinstein. There's been a, a bunch of these stories that have popped up late and have had zero coverage at all because it seems at least that the media has gone into full Gavin Newsom protection mode. No matter what story comes out, they're just going to ignore it and try to ride this uh the fear that they've created around larry elder to the finish line is is that the right way to look at this oh yeah i mean they, they've completely ignored those stories 
Uh, and, you know, look, to me, this is a lot like uh, deja vu from the O.J. Simpson verdict. This is kind of a weird analogy coming from me. But, uh, you know, I knew O.J. was going to get acquitted. I was it was you were bracing for that injustice. The evidence against him was overwhelming, like it was against Gavin Newsom. But you have a jury pool that is ignorant and is not being given all the right information and has their own cultural biases. And so uh, very quickly, we're going to see the wrong verdict being delivered. And there's going to be enormous ramifications not just here, but in, or throughout the country. Uh, because I, I really do believe that for this to ever end, this, this COVID insanity, there has to be a lightning strike at some point. You don't get too many opportunities for a lightning strike. This was the perfect opportunity, mm. and we lost it. And when that ever comes around again, I don't know. Uh, maybe the midterms next year, but th those are going to have a whole series of other problems. I believe Trump is going to be a problem in that. And I think his influence in this uh, recall election should be a lesson to Republicans, but it won't be because the most of the conservative media won't tell that story. And that's why we're in a very, very dysfunctional and dangerous situation, Stu. I will point out to the audience that the as of right now, the election is not over yet. Can, you can continue to feel a little bit more positive than John. It's OK. Um, John, one last one here, though, because you mentioned this. And I think this is an interesting thing to think out. There are certain areas of this country that, you know, love Donald Trump and uh, and think he's the greatest guy in the world. California obviously is not one of these areas in a race like this. When you're in a blue state like this, was this a winnable race if someone, you know, I don't know if it's the mayor of San Diego who didn't seem to get much uh, attention at all or a, a big, you know, obviously Schwarzenegger was the last time this 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 uh, this went on. There was a more moderate Republican option. If that sort of thing was available or and was promoted in the media, was this a winnable race? You would need almost the perfect Republican that does not exist in mm. this state. By the way, our Republicans in this state are rather Trumpy, and people will be shocked to know that there's no county in which Donald Trump got more votes than L.A. County mm. in the entire country. Wow. And by the way, it wasn't it wasn't close. Um, and that's partially because L.A. County is so large. But sure. there uh, but it, it's a weird dynamic uh, here in California. We have a lot of very, very conservative voters that just were outnumbered. Um, Look, uh, I have a fantasy because uh, I know you think I'm a pessimist, but I always try to come up with some hope. <laughs> all right. So so here's my fantasy. All right. Here's mm -hmm. my fantasy for saving this after we unfortunately lose tonight. Hopefully it's by a close enough margin where someone is willing to run against him next year. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. Kevin Costner runs as an independent, mm. gets into the final two because there's not enough Republicans to vote against him, and that's how our system works. We don't have we don't have actual primaries right. in this state. It's the it's the, the top primary. two. Yeah, yeah. So Kevin Costner runs as a true independent, and if it's Costner versus Newsom in 2022, Kevin Costner will eat. Gavin Newsom's lunch, I guarantee. <laughs> I don't know if Kevin Costner would be a gov good governor, but I do want to see Gavin Newsom lose. So if that's what <laughs> it takes, I would like to see it. Uh, John Ziegler, senior columnist for Mediaite, uh, author of How Gavin Newsom and the News Media Defeated His Recall and What It Means for America. We hold out positivity. We hold out hope. But uh, John makes a lot of really good points here, and we'll see how this goes uh, going forward. Uh, make sure to check my Twitter uh, for the uh, link to the story and follow John as well on Twitter. John, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu. Okay, you know those Jake from State Farm commercials where the handsome and youthful insurance agent pals around with sports legends and Hollywood stars and apparently makes it impossible for Aaron Rodgers to complete a pass for my fantasy team. Of course you've seen those commercials because you can't do anything else when you turn on the television. They run like every four minutes. So I was reading an article about the new NBA 2K22 game that's coming out uh, soon. And wouldn't you know it, for some ridiculous reason, our world famous and beloved Jake from State Farm is an in-game character inside the video game. Um, so obviously I immediately started researching because I didn't have anything else to do. And it turns out if you spend a little bit of time exploring the game's online mode called The City, you can find this. Hi. Hey, neighbor. Are you 
Jake from State Farm. Oh, you hang out here, bro? Yeah, hey, right next to the course in your neighborhood. Hey, that's dope, fam. <laughs> As a show of my support, I'd like to offer you my official look. You can't join Team State Farm without the drip, right? Hey, look, I guess not, bro. <laughs> hey, awesome. I'll be seeing you around, MP. Let me know if you need anything. And remember, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I was waiting for you to say it, man. <laughs> That looks like a really fun game. You can walk through the mall and go to an insurance store and talk to Jake from State Farm. Now, seeing Jake from State Farm in a video game, I know it's pretty life-affirming and everything, um, but it also reminded me that the man appearing in the gate claiming to be Jake from State Farm wasn't always Jake from State Farm. Let me take you on a television odyssey back to the Dark Ages, like... 2011. Yeah, I'm married. Doesn't matter. You do that for me? Really? Yeah, I'd like that. Who are you talking to? Uh, it's Jake from State Farm. Sounds like a really good deal. Jake from State Farm at 3 in the morning? Who is this? It's, it's Jake from State Farm. What are you wearing, Jake from State Farm? Uh, khakis. She sounds hideous. Well, she's a guy, so... Now, that's your, uh, your daddy's Jake from State Farm. The OG, the, o, the OJ, which OJ Simpson ruined. Uh, either way, the khakis Jake from 2011 would not be allowed to be on TV, would he? He was, did not hang around for very long. Now they got this, like, young buff guy uh, who is the, the face of State Farm. What happened? Well, shortening, shortly after that commercial aired, and it aired, like, a trillion times when it was on television... They pulled the ads, and they were exiled to YouTube forever. Did you know this? Now, why would they do such a thing? Well, of course, you just heard it in that original commercial. The wife character had the absolute gall to imply that a woman with a low masculine voice might be unattractive. Transphobia! Sexism! Kink shaming, probably, at least. There's just no place for that in the world. And apparently State Farm agreed. They really pulled these ads for that reason because, well, she sounds hideous. Uh, well, she's a guy. Oh, that's way over the line these days. Fast forward to 2019 and actor Kevin Miles resurrects the role without the transphobic baggage and accompanied uh, by that sweet, sweet diversity box check, which is always nice. But back to schlubby white khakis Jake, the old school Jake, the OJ. Did you know that he wasn't just an actor losing out on a paying gig? No, no. The truth is far more demoralizing than that for the original Jake from State Farm. His name was Jake Stone from State Farm, and he was just like a real insurance agent in Bloomington, Illinois. He happened to audition for an internal casting call within the company for this stupid commercial, which was a huge hit. Everyone thought it was really funny. He was just, you know, a showbiz nobody who was able to become a pop culture, you know, sensation overnight because of the stupid commercial. And then he had it ripped away from him by this guy, the new Jake from State Farm. Look at him with the glasses in his mouth, who famously played the role of customer in the film Lap Dance, which Jeffy also played that role many, many times. Now, I'm not here to cancel Kevin Miles, the new State Farm guy or boycott State Farm. I don't care. But I will say I do care enough that we should call for the original Jake from State Farm to be reinstated to his proper role. I want to see that guy shirtless. But did I just admit I wanted to see the other Jake Farm from State Farm shirtless? Yes, maybe I did. But I will say this. The old Jake from State Farm didn't deserve to get the boot because we were a country too weak to handle the dark edge of his humor. They could even add Jake from State Farm into the basketball game so they could walk around the mall together. Kind of like they did back when they had the two Spocks in the Star Trek reboot. You know, except obviously in this, this time you'd make it good. Back in a second. Recently, I've discovered that living indoors is better than living outdoors. Um, you don't want to, I mean, people, you know, there's people out there that camp. I don't know how you do it. That seems like a lot of work. And all you're doing is you're living outside. Hopefully, you're able to live inside some sort of domicile, a home of sorts. I know, it's elitist. 
It's the type of thing that people that go to the Met Gala might have. But if you happen to be one of those people who wants to live inside a home, you need a real estate agent who you can trust. And realestateagentsitrust.com is the best place to go to find that person. Now, you're going to need an internet connection, too. So we're talking about a house and an internet connection. I'm asking a lot of you. However, Real Estate Agents I Trust is Glenn's company, so you can be rest assured that you're going to be in the hands of the most capable people in the industry who will see your transaction through to the very end. The name says it all, realestateagentsitrust.com. Get more information at realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Ah, Olympic skiing venue Squaw Valley Resort is no more. Obviously, of course, Squaw. That's offensive, I think, for some reason. Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows Ski Resort has announced it will change its name to Palisades Tahoe, which I think are two different vehicles. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Squaw is considered racist and sexist. Is it? I don't, I don't know if it is. I decided to go to do a little research on this, and I came across this site, uh, Indian Country Today. And they asked the question, the word squaw, offensive or not? Okay. The word squaw certainly has had its share of history. That's kind of true with everything. But uh, in researching its meaning, squaw is either offensive or means a female Indian woman. So it's either offensive or it's just the name of a woman. I don't know. Apparently it's not the name of a mountain anymore. We now know that. Uh, also, there is a new series coming out on Netflix. I can't be more pumped up about this one. Wait until you see the star of the new one, Colin in black and white. Life puts us on a path, sometimes narrow, sometimes windy, but always ours. In this game, we can't speak our truth. All you do is speak. In this game, all you do. It feels like the only choice we have is theirs. Oh. Believe in your path. And by doing that, we can become who we're destined to be. Oh, God. A Colin Kaepernick biopic series. I can't wait for it. I wonder if they will cover the time that he lost his job to Blaine Gabbert before he ever took a knee. I wonder if that will come up. I wonder if one of the worst seasons for an NFL quarterback in modern history will be mentioned in this series. That would be interesting. Perhaps the worst game played by a football player in the last two decades. Will they mention that? I don't know, but I know where it will be mentioned on this t-shirt and mug. You're going to love it. Uh, always remember, before Colin Kaepernick took a knee, he lost his job to Blaine Gabbert. It's available on mugs and t-shirts. The ultimate tailgate appropriate gear and now whenever you're watching the dumb netflix series you can always remind people of the truth that colin kaepernick sucks really sad news today as norm mcdonald uh, passed away he was 61 years old um he died of cancer apparently had been battling cancer for 10 years which no one really knew outside of his close circle. And that was, it's an interesting thing where I've always liked Norm MacDonald. I've always thought he was really funny. But he does seem to have uh, received a new level of respect over the past few years. And you wonder if some of that was people realizing, like, this guy's really in a fight for his life and, and we need to honor him before he passes, unlike everybody else. Um, so he did get some of that adulation, which is great. He deserved it. Norm MacDonald, sadly dead at 61. See you tomorrow.